Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's, uh, this is Brian Berger. I'm the editor of Space News, and I want to welcome you all to joining us for this webinar. Uh, we're here today to discuss OneWeb's bankruptcy and uh, what it means both for OneWeb, its, um, its creditors, and the, the larger space community. Um, leading this conversation today is Space News telecom reporter Caleb Henry. Caleb? Are you on? Everything working okay with you? I am on. Excellent. Um, so without any further ado, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Caleb and let him introduce our panel and, and get this going. Thanks very much, folks. All right. Thanks, Brian. And thanks, everybody, for being with us. We're looking forward to discussing this topic. I think everybody is discussing this from their homes, wherever they are, because of the current coronavirus situation. I'm uh, looking forward to this. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm going to turn it over now to our panelists to do brief introductions from themselves, uh, and then we'll dig into the conversation. Uh, actually, one, one thing before that, I do want to mention, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A during this. I see we already have a few questions, and several people have sent me their questions over the past 36 hours or so. Thank you for sending those. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Uh, I've received a lot, so we'll try to do our best with those. Uh, to our panelists. Who would you like to go first? I think Claude's got his mic off, or, or on, sorry. So we can start with Claude and then yes. uh, go down the line. All line. right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Claude Lusso. I'm Research Director with Northern Sky Research, and I cover a lot of the uh, research that we do on satellite manufacturing, launch services, earth observation, imaging, high altitude platforms, and many emerging markets. I'm very pleased to be here and looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Chris. Chris, are you with us? Okay, I think we might be having uh, audio. It looks like you're muted as well as Janice. Janice, are you with us? I don't know. Okay. Hi. I'm Janice Starzik. I'm the Vice President of Commercial Space at Bryce Space Technology. Uh, we cover the space market from ground to lunar and Mars exploration, so pretty wide breadth. And I've been on the, the commercial satellite and launch side for most of the last 15 years. Uh, so, Excited to talk about this. All right, great. Uh, Chris, do we have you? It looks like we do. I'm showing Chris is unmuted at this point. Chris, can you hear us? So, Caleb, I'll figure out what's going on with Chris. If you want to get going, then we can have Chris kind of jump in when he first talks. He can he can introduce himself. Okay, great. We'll we'll figure that out. Uh, in the meantime, I'll talk with uh, Claude and Janice. Uh, so we saw the news about two weeks ago, OneWeb went bankrupt. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around OneWeb in general for the coronavirus. I think what they were trying to do is uh, in many ways revolutionary, even though um, there were constellations that had tried or companies that had tried to put up large numbers of satellites in the past. Uh, a lot of what I'd heard over the past few years was that the technology had changed and that a LEO constellation for internet to everyone was now much more feasible than in the past. Uh, most recently in OneWeb's bankruptcy filing, they blamed the coronavirus for basically undoing their financial progress. Uh, I'd like to hear from you guys uh, how much you think the coronavirus is actually to blame for OneWeb's bankruptcy. I can start. Um... It's not, other than the timing. Uh, <laughs> I think we all, you know, had our, our doubts and have seen them struggling on, on the financial side for some time. But uh, certainly the immediate liquidity situation will have precipitated a more immediate action, but it was not likely to change the outcome either way. Well, I'd have to agree the writing was on the wall, if we can say this. Uh, there were activists and their main shareholder that were reported to ask SoftBank, uh, main shareholder, to 
uh, basically divest their money losing um, uh, investments. And then last year, we also had read reports of a write down on char uh, write down charges on uh, various uh, investors into OneWeb. So that was not really um, a very positive uh, outcome already. And maybe, as Janice said, that this whole COVID-19 situation accelerated things. Okay. Um, Chris, it looks like I think your audio is on. Yeah, we got it working now. Oh, Thanks, Woo. <laughs> and Chris, you need to introduce yourself too, because I think uh, we, had a, we had to skip you uh, when we first came to you. Yeah, Chris, who are you? Ah, so uh, my name is Chris Quilty. Uh, I'm the uh, partner here at Quilty Analytics. I spent about 30 years writing buy-sell recommendations on public company stocks. Uh, started Quilty Analytics about three or four years ago, and we are a boutique uh, entirely focused on the satellite and space sector uh, with a range of services from research to investment banking and uh, strategy work. Okay, and next, while we're on the, the subject of the first question, uh, what do you think it was that, that caused OneWeb to fail? Do you think it was the coronavirus, or do you think it was more complicated than that? Well, the coronavirus was perhaps the uh, straw that broke the camel's back, but uh, having done the, the deep work of digging through a lot of the filings of the company, uh, it, it's apparent that, I mean, their financial struggles have been ongoing since really the summer of 2018, where they've been living on a lifeline, uh, maybe a couple months worth of cash availability. And uh, although it wasn't disclosed at the time, uh, SoftBank had uh, put in place a promissory note that they were living off of. It was eventually rolled into a larger uh, uh, senior secured notes that again was announced, but uh, I think most participants uh, assumed that that was a equity financing, whereas in fact it was a, uh, a credit facility that they put in place. Okay. Now the, the asset that OneWeb has put forward as potentially being of the most value during this bankruptcy proceeding is its spectrum. Uh, I'm curious what all our panelists think of uh, that that proposition. Uh, how valuable is OneWeb Spectrum, and who might actually be interested in buying it? I think it's a question of which spectrum and for whom. Right. So they they list they list a lot of uh, filings with different com countries. They have filings in the UK and France and Canada. Um, I don't know which they think is valuable and to whom. I think the, it might just be the, the British or the French ones that are brought into use at this point. True, yeah. So they OneWeb does have several filings across multiple countries. The one that they've made progress on with the 74 satellites that they've launched were, uh, like were licensed through France and the UK for a constellation of 720 satellites using KU and KA band spectrum. Uh, I, I believe that that would probably be the one that they're talking about, though, of course, there are many, as you pointed out. I guess for the sake of this conversation, let's let's talk about the one that's been brought into use and and now has potential to build out a constellation. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer up. I mean, I think the really the most valuable spectrum is their KU band user links. Uh, that's the same spectrum that they share with uh, SpaceX. Uh, those filings, as you noted, are actually in the uh, the Jersey Islands, uh, so they fall under Ofcom and the. Uh, the UK authorities, um, and clearly they're they're desirable in terms of their use for a Leo broadband type constellation. Uh, you asked who might be interested. Obviously, the other Leo broadband players at one level, uh, but if you go down from there, I mean, it, it could be a broad range of, of potential companies. Everything from defense contractors to mobile MNOs, the other satellite operators, and perhaps even. There's a number of uh, startup satellite operators uh, not focusing on broadband that might find some use for the spectrum. Uh, I think the biggest problem with the spectrum, you know, unlike the days of old when you could warehouse spectrum and sit on it for an extended period of time, as you noted, Caleb, uh, there are specific new rules that came into place uh, starting on January 1st. Uh, it came out of the WRC 19, and these are ITU rules. There were also FCC rules in place that set definitive timelines that they have to bring the satellite into use by launching a certain number of satellites. 
they hit the first wicket for the ITU at 10%, but their first FCC uh, gateway really doesn't come until about two years from now. And uh, they've got to get 360 satellites up by then in order to keep their FCC licenses valid. So uh, there's uh, some steep capital spending that any buyer of this spectrum is going to have to uh, be committed to in order to keep these the uh, licenses themselves valid. Yeah, that's, that's important. Um, I'm curious how the panel thinks that the OneWeb constellation compares or, or contrasts to other systems, perhaps in the, the past. Uh, I know I spoke with Matt Desch recently, and one of the things that he mentioned, so Iridium went bankrupt after Motorola and others put, uh, most of Motorola, but uh, several investors put billions of dollars into their system. But when they emerged from bankruptcy, they had a complete constellation already for OneWeb. They still have a lot to go. Uh, what do you think There's that means? There's a difference, certainly. <laughs> you know, they're wiping out some of their costs, but not enough of it to really make the difference that it made for Iridium and Global Star. Do you and think the it's other possible? distinction the other distinction there is uh, you know at least in the case of Iridium, they had satellites that were, you know, for uh, for amortization purposes, they were designed for eight years. For technical purposes, they were designed for 10. They lasted 20. And if they had not lasted 20, they might not have been able to recapitalize and replace that constellation in time. Uh, none of the constellations, but you know, the partial exception of Telesat uh, with their design today is designed to last that long. So any, again, a buyer of the spectrum, not only do they have to hit the BIU, they also have to be able to recapitalize and replace the satellites as they move along. Yeah, and let's not forget the uh, Department of Defense came in with uh, continuous support to uh, Iridium and improvements actually, and they did uh, a really good job at nurturing that relationship, which uh, at the time was basically their savings grace. What do you guys, what do you all think uh, the possibility is that a buyer purchases OneWeb and they actually come out to fulfill the original vision of OneWeb? Do you think that after bankruptcy, OneWeb will emerge looking anything like the constellation and business that was proposed before this? I, I My answer is it, it, it better or they're going to lose their, their uh, license. Uh, again, the, the new ITU rules that are in place have very narrow swim lanes around the architecture of the satellites and the constellation. And, uh, you know, you can't just buy the licenses and repurpose them. Uh, you're using shared spectrum. That's another big difference between the Global Stars and Iridiums and Orbcoms. They all had dedicated own spectrum. They didn't have to coordinate with anyone else. So if you change the design of the satellite system, the power levels, anything, you've got to do some pretty extensive testing to make sure you're not going to interfere uh, with the other participants using that spectrum. I, I think going back to your previous question about the point in time in which they're filing and the proportion of their costs that they're taking out of the equation, uh, if they do come back as originally intended, I still don't think that they're at the cost targets that they initially thought they'd be at, even wiping out the three and a half billion that they've had to date. Unfortunately, that that's still a pretty big hurdle. And that's an underestimation. We've been saying for a while that their total capex is cert certainly north of five billion maybe six, some of people estimated at 10 to 12 billion. So we're uh, not even counting in here the recurring replenishment costs of the constellation if they go seven to 10 years. So that's already, you know, one year into it. So it's at the most in nine years. And then the last but not the least is how ready is the market for that offering at the price point that we know will make this a success. And that's unfortunately not really um, talked about a lot. And we feel that there should have been more conversations about that prior to even launching. More conversations about their overall cost structure? And the business case itself and the market demand and market readiness and the adoption rates and plus the ground terminals. 
Yeah, it's a, an interesting point. I know uh, OneWeb is perhaps most famous for the desire to connect the whole world, but most recently their CEO, Adrian Steckel, has talked a lot about building that up by connecting planes, by connecting ships, by connecting enterprise customers and, and governments. Um, I guess there's a question in there somewhere. I'm trying not to do the thing that I call others out on <laughs> while moderating. I think, I think part of the issue that maybe you're driving towards, Caleb, is the fact that uh, for all these constellations, and you know, certainly with OneWeb, they started out with a consumer focus, uh, then sort of visibly did a pivot to the enterprise market. And you know, we think uh, we, we did a extensive 80-page report on all the, the Leo constellations. You know, one of the big issues that none of these companies have yet solved is the issue of the consumer terminal. And you know, we're looking at consumer terminal costs that just simply are not affordable for any kind of consumer application. I mean, uh, and you know, I think OneWeb did a smart pivot. If, if you're going into the aviation and the maritime, those enterprise customers can afford an expensive terminal. Uh, and so again, anybody that's looking at you know, this business model and trying to pick it up and move forward with it, has to keep in mind that they've got a narrow end market focus that they're going to go after, and they have to provide a better service than the one that's currently being provided by the geo uh, high throughput satellites out there. I was looking at some of the initial statements yesterday on uh, their, their cost targets for the terminal side. And, you know, back in 2015, they're talking about these communal antennas that are basically going to provide service to everyone in the vicinity for $200. That was going to be completely rugged and uh, be able to serve, you know, a, a, a very wide radius. So that doesn't exist. And we're still not even near feasibility of anything in that range. Yeah, I think that's interesting because we've seen comments from SpaceX and Amazon both saying that their constellations, they anticipate serving the consumer market. It doesn't sound all that dissimilar to me, at least, from what OneWeb is trying to do. Do you think, uh, this open question for anybody, I think Chris has his mic off, so we'll go with you first. Uh, do you think that SpaceX and Amazon are positioned to run into the same challenges as far as having actual user terminals that customers can buy? Uh, do you think that they'll run into the same issue? I think they're all trying to solve the same technology issue, uh, which is a low cost flat panel, electronically steered multi-beam antenna. And uh, at least at low cost, those that product does not exist in the market today. And they all have to solve that same problem. Let's remember also that a lot of the CapEx over the past five years has gone into the space segment compared to the ground segment, which we believe is key for closing the business case. And in our view, that's really the, the missing link. And we've been harping on this for many years. Uh, and, and a lot of people are doing really great technology development to get there. It's just a question of this technology is not that easy to develop. There's a lot of use cases. I believe that there should probably be more focus in that sense and also investments that uh, needed to go into a very few specific, uh, narrow uh, uh, applications rather than having, you know, a uh, flat panel antenna and electronically steered antenna developed for maybe 12 or 13 or 14 applications. And another thing is, you know, I don't think OneWeb has been targeting the consumer market for several years now. I mean, I, this really became an enterprise uh, system, not a consumer system. But in the case of, of Starlink and for Amazon's Kuiper, I mean, those are those are vertically developed systems at this point. We don't have good information on what they're doing. But certainly in the case of Amazon, we know they have the resources to throw at this problem that no one else does. Uh, so there's certainly a different, a different perspective coming to this. You know, OneWeb, all of OneWeb's technology is third party, whereas the, both those two companies are really doing everything internally. Okay, um, I'd like to talk some about the implications of the OneWeb bankruptcy for OneWeb suppliers and, and partners. Uh, the largest company, or the company with the the most unsecured. Debt, uh, I believe, was Arianspas. 
from this. They had a contract for 21 Soyuz launches and then the maiden flight of Ariane 6. What kind of impact do you think the bankruptcy will have on Ariane Spas and others that were positioned to support OneWeb? Uh, so, launch, sorry. Go ahead, Janice. <laughs> on the launch side, you know, launch vehicles are are repurposable. So I, I don't think that's the side of the supply chain that we would be worried about. You want to touch on the others? Yeah. So again, we uh, we scoured through the bankruptcy documents and and created a report that listed out you know all the major secured unsecured creditors, the equity holders, the debt holders, and we went through, I mean, if you look at it, the equity holders are, they're wiped out. There's, there's nothing left for them. The creditors, again, are probably going to get, you know, pennies on the dollar. And uh, once you go down the list of the unsecured creditors, the suppliers, there's an important distinction you have to make here, which is OneWeb file for bankruptcy. OneWeb supplier of the satellites is Airbus OneWeb Satellite Ventures, which is a 50-50 joint venture with a factory outside the gates of uh, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, that entity has not filed for bankruptcy. They haven't filed for restructuring. Most of the contracts, the actual suppliers that are providing hardware, uh, are not listed in the bankruptcy filings. Uh, they have a, a you know, unsecured credit uh, and, and accounts payable, receivable from uh, uh, Airbus OneWeb Satellite Ventures. And until and, and, and if they eventually put some kind of a filing, we don't know who the list of those vendors are. Uh, we did, uh, again, source about a dozen and a half that we were able to identify through some, uh, some filings. Uh, and for example, just to give you a, a, an order of magnitude, uh, yesterday, Teledyne Technologies, which was announced as one of the three first vendors uh, for Airbus, uh, they put out a, a preliminary earnings for the first quarter, and they specifically called out $40 million write-down associated with OneWeb Satellite Ventures. Uh, and again, they're one of about 40 vendors that are exposed, and uh, that's the big concern you know, that we've identified is you know, we've already got a fairly fragile uh, supplier base here. Uh, many of them are single source to, to Airbus and those same vendors, however, you know, could eventually become suppliers to Telesat, uh, as somebody already pointed out. Probably not SpaceX and probably not Amazon since those two have indicated that they, they tend to look at more of a vertically integrated manufacturing, uh, but it will have broader implications on the overall supply base. Yeah, we agree as well. And we've noticed uh, many tier two, tier three uh, component manufacturers already were having uh, to deal with very tight deadlines, especially with the advent of smaller satellites in the range of 150 kilos, like uh, OneWeb. That put a lot of pressure on them. And many of those were actually you know, quite uh, strained in their production and delivery already. So definitely that will not be uh, looking good for many of them. I'm curious, Claude, what do you think the impact uh, might be for companies that want to launch small satellites? So this wasn't a, a huge discussion around OneWeb because they mainly were going to use the Soyuz vehicle and launch 34 to 36 satellites at a time. But they did also have a contract with Virgin Orbit for launches of presumably one to two spacecraft at a time. And uh, if there was going to be a lot of demand to LEO, it seemed like many of these startups were banking on it. Do you think that this is a warning for small launch vehicle developers that the market they're focused on might not be as sound as they think? It's a very high risk market. And to be honest with you, if you just look at how long it took Rocket Lab to get, you know, their satellite, uh, um, their services up and running, it's years. It's, you know, tens of years, uh, almost 10 years for them. And it's a lot of CapEx. And it's definitely something that the uh, a lot of the uh, potential small sat launches will look into twice. There are constellations out there, but then the likelihood of those constellations is something that needs to be rated. There's gating criteria also for those constellations that we often forget to look at. Well, launch is one of them, one of the you know, gating criteria to take to, uh, your constellation to orbit and to make it run. After that, there's a whole bunch of, of course, regulations and funding and stuff like that. But it is definitely something that small sat launches will have to, to look into. And, uh, it's going to be a sur survival of the fittest uh, situation in, in the coming year for sure. 
Okay, uh, Claude, while I, I have you, I think you made this comment about uh, Iridium having the DoD as a backer. We had a question that came in. Somebody was asking, what are the odds that the DoD could bail out more or less another Leo company that was struggling? Uh, do you think that it's possible DoD could be the, the savior for OneWeb or whoever the future OneWeb is? Maybe not one web, but the interest in constellations and different architecture has definitely uh, gone up quite a bit in the U.S. DoD in the past year. And there are concepts out there, as you, you know, probably know, Blackjack from DARPA is one of them. There's definitely something to be said about the interest level being really, really high for constellations. One web in particular, maybe not at the production rates, the rapid responsiveness of uh, commercial operators is being looked at far more than ever before. But yeah, it will be tough, I think, to get DOD to basically subscribe to something that's incomplete. And I would also note here that, uh, you know, OneWeb is registered in Jersey, UK, Ofcom, <clears throat> and although they're a, uh, you know, Five Eyes country, I mean, there are consequences for not filing and paying taxes in the US. and. You know, in an earlier life, we were involved with taking Iridium public and, you know, there were, uh, I think, discussions around, you know, perhaps tax saving measures. And I think at the end of the day, the decision was made, it's better to, to file with the FCC and be a U.S. company if you want to have DOD business. I think there's also some uh, differences of opinion within DOD. You know, we, we see some statements talking about full support for the commercial missions and the blackjack program and, and clearly DOD is, is the biggest tester and user of Starlink at this point. Uh, but you know, Mike Griffin came out and made some comments in, in December saying we can't rely on this. You know, this is way too risky and, and we need to build our own. We need our a, a, you know reliable architecture. So maybe he's patting himself on the back a bit right now. So maybe a saving grace for one web satellites, but perhaps not one web itself. Mm -hmm. uh, curious another thing so we've seen a lot of constellation activity um, I guess I'm thinking about multiple different basically anything in, in Leo right now a lot of the Leo activity as far as communications is concerned is actually focused on IOT the internet of things connecting be it like a, a water sensor on a farm somewhere or uh, monitoring a pipeline to make sure that it doesn't leak and things like that uh, is there any anticipation or expectation that something like the, the one web bankruptcy could impact IOT startups? To a certain level, yes, but no. Yes, probably on the funding. But then again, we just saw today in Mariota raised you know, 28 million in Australia. And at the same time, Sky and Space Global just uh, went into receivership. So. Uh, I think the business case, again, I'll come back to that, of constellations will be key. Let's remember also for M2M IoT, those are very low capex uh, endeavors compared to the high throughput satellite constellations like OneWeb. So that makes a big, big, big difference. But at the same time, the average revenue you know, expected per terminal is much lower. So they have to have uh, a lot of them out there. So in a way, the in a general sense, we feel that the M2M IoT business has a better uh, um, chance of making it, and but there's a lot of competition out there too. And for current, you know, the incumbents, there's a ton of competition. Mm -hmm. I would, yeah, I would. We talk about Iridium and Global Star all the time, but nobody ever mentions Orbcom, which went through the same process. Um, so. On the one side, yes, there is uh, maybe a little bit more skepticism in funding, maybe a little bit more uh, digging into the business case of uh, constellations to make sure these numbers have some basis. Uh, but in calling out the ones that have struggled from the beginning, like OneWeb and, and Sky and Space has been struggling for quite a while, uh, you are taking out some of the risk of these constellations launching and then and then you know failing once in orbit and really destroying your your market for capacity uh, so it's actually re removing some of the risk from the market yeah and I would agree I think there's an important distinction you have to make here 
between these Leo broadband providers and the IoT companies. Um, it was a huge capital uh, requirement for the Leo broadband that doesn't necessarily exist with a lot of the smaller players in the market. Now, a high-profile bank bankruptcy like this, I mean, let's not lie to ourselves, it does have an impact on the fundraising environment. I think the bigger issue really today is this COVID-19 and how that's impacting the fundraising environment. And, uh, you know, we've talked to a number of folks out there, uh, you know, on the venture capital and private equity side. Most of these folks are not looking or they're they're barely looking at new investments. They're, they're primarily uh, looking at their existing portfolio and trying to save their existing companies and deciding who lives and who dies. Um, you know, overall, I think, and, and you guys, if you haven't seen it, Bryce does a great job with their space startup report, and it's free on their website if you hit it. Uh, they do a good job of breaking down the numbers, and over half of the investment dollars, I think, in the last two or three years have gone to the big Leo high-profile constellations, or more than half. So there's still substantial funding flowing to some of the smaller players in the market, but, you know, for those that are not don't currently have backers. I mean, the, the COVID-19 crisis is the gating factor of when those those spigots will start to open again. Thanks, Chris. Shout out to Bryce. <laughs> uh, curious if anybody else has thoughts on the, the impact of the coronavirus. We definitely said we would talk about that too. Um, a lot of space companies or aerospace companies have sort of been lumped in with defense and that's given them some protection as a, an essential industry despite the coronavirus but how hard do you guys really see this hitting the space industry janice do you want to start with that yeah there's there's a lot of different factors at play um i think one thing that that particularly hurts is yes we're lumped in with defense but two of our biggest players are the two big air airline or aircraft builders right who are completely struggling from the other side of this with the complete stop of air travel. So that's going to make it really hard for those two companies to absorb some of the, the space side. Um, you know, yes, space is, is essential in most of these places and, and continues to operate. And, uh, you know, thankfully we're all working right now, which is fantastic. Um, but uh, it's, it depends on where you are in your cycle. So on, on the venture capital side, you know, as our report showed that the the money flowing has been unbelievable and has not stopped so we we've hit records the last three years of investment in the sector and yes it's it's on pause right now because everybody has to take another look at what their portfolio is and there's certainly a, more of a crunch on liquidity but most of the companies in the sector are long-term play they are not anticipating revenues in the next year so the investment decision shouldn't be that different other than where your risk tolerance lies. Um, and with bankruptcies like this, culling out some of the weaker players and making it more difficult for some of the more questionable business cases to get follow through in their funding, it might you know, really become a stronger industry as a result. Yeah, I would tend to agree. And one of the things we've done is a survey of Asking our clients what uh, has been the impact of COVID, of course, the impact uh, is significant. There are, um, most, most folks say that the, it has either a high, significant or a low impact on their business going forward. But what's interesting is that uh, nobody really thinks that it's all positive. Very few people think this is positive. And like Chris mentioned, and also Janice, the, the, the recoil on that is more solid foundations going forward, really. But yeah, operators, manufacturers, launch uh, service providers, I mean, many of them are helping the cause by, you know, repurposing some of their production to, for example, making masks and uh, protective gear for the medical uh, community. But long term, as Janice said, this is true. We have the fortunate uh, um, situation to be in an industry that has longer timelines. However, the fact that in the past few years, those investment in many of those uh, companies that we saw funded were specifically to launch small sats or help them launch or get to orbit. So that has decreased the timelines. And in doing so, it has put a lot of pressure, as I mentioned earlier on, on the whole value chain. So it's one thing also to say that we have 
on one hand, longer terms. Unfortunately, governments seem to be playing the game here by stimulus m money and also NASA and other agencies, DOD are helping uh, um, pay their suppliers or paying them in an accelerated basis sometimes. But there are going to be some uh, pains to go through this, especially since milestones mm -hmm. now in the small side industry uh, in particular come much faster. And by coming much faster, there's less uh, time to rethink over or to have a, a bit of a cushion to be able to execute properly. Okay. It, it, it's hard to find much of a silver lining in this. Um, and I think we, we put out a piece and you can access it via LinkedIn that looked at the COVID impact on the industry. And it really, it depends on your sector, right? Any of the service providers with large exposure to cruise and airline, you know, not good. Uh, in fact, you know, we expect that, um, you know, one or more of those companies will, will likely follow the same path as OneWeb here within the next month or two if we don't see a significant change in the environment. Uh, on the flip side, you know, as, as previously mentioned, almost every company in this industry has a national security exemption, which they can then pass down the line to their vendors to keep their factories running. So uh, at least unlike a, a restaurant or a cruise ship, they're generating some revenues, you know, not, not optimal, but uh, the companies are continuing to run. And the other point I guess I would make here is you know, if you look for the silver lining, is there anybody that comes out of this on the upside? Um, and it's a bit off topic from here, but uh, the geospatial analytics, the satellite imagery side of this industry could actually come out a net beneficiary. I mean, you're not using people to go out and look at things. You, you have to, in ways that companies have never used before, access satellite imagery and the analytics related to it in order to assess the business environment of things that are going on. So uh, I'm sure none of those companies are going to be raising estimates this quarter, but um, you know, coming off the back end of this, you could see some permanent changes in the way that people use that technology in a way that, that provides a permanent lift. I can add to that, you know, yeah, there's certainly a, a look for the data analytics side of, of that business has always been struggling to create markets. So we have all of this technology developing and, and the ability to provide all this data. It's, it's what do you do with it and how do you monetize it that has been the problem and how to create the market and the demand for that data. This, is, this might help us in that regard because everybody searching for data to give them answers uh, might provide some impetus to those doing the data analytics to, to you know, further that side of the market along to create a more stable, more uh, definable market for the data. Um, plus, you know, there's also a different perspective on what resilience means now. Uh, we, we're in a situation we really couldn't have conceived before that the entire world would be sitting at home trying to do business. That changes the, the feeling of what communications networks means and what, uh, you know, backup means for a lot of companies. And there is the opportunity to create new demand and new markets out of this for our industry that it's not going to be easy by any means, especially given the, the financial markets and liquidity situation probably for most of this year. Uh, I'm curious if anybody sees any other areas of the, the space industry beyond geospatial that might benefit from this. I think Janice, you pointed out that we're all doing this from home. That means we're, we're relying on uh, internet connectivity. Probably not satellite, I'm guessing, for, for most people here, but uh, does satellite broadband look like a beneficiary or IoT or, uh, Chris, I know this was part of your report. Um, where else might there be, where might the pros, weirdly enough, outweigh the cons in this current so situation? So I'll, I'll talk a little from my personal experience on, on connectivity and, and connectivity outside of, you know, the, the United States and Europe. Uh, you know, I was just living in, in South America for three years. And um, while I was there, I had a fiber connection. That was great. I had a 4G phone that worked everywhere I went. I was really not lacking connectivity anywhere uh, throughout basically all of South America. Uh, unless I was, you know, in the jungle or, or you know, behind a mountain. Um, but, 
generally speaking, if, if anyone can afford to buy the broadband, they will have it built to them because that's where it makes sense to build it. So I'm having trouble still, you know, getting behind this justifies broadband networks to consumers in any way because I don't I don't see that market justifying the, the build out of a constellation in, in the you know eight to twelve billion dollar range. And we already talked about the terminal still being a major problem that has not been solved that we know of. Uh, but you know when you're talking about people that can afford to pay five to ten dollars a month, you, you can't talk about terminals that cost thousands of dollars. It just doesn't work. I guess I need to move to Bogota because I live in downtown St. Pete's, a city of a quarter million. I had to cancel my T-Mobile because I couldn't get a connection in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I would think that another place where you'll see, of course, you know, uh, depending on how long the crisis continues is business continuity services and you know government military of course may have uh, maybe there to to help uh, some of the businesses continue running but also using their services uh, depending on how if there are uh, more deployment broadcast to a certain level although advertisement dollars well you know they're going up on, t on tv for sure but uh, how long will that last for specialty channels that's a, that's another issue but yeah maybe that's going to be one and yes you're right and to miot the fact that it's uh, probably a low, lower cost, lower capex uh, venture may help, but there's, like I said, a ton of competition out there for that. So, but there's a lot, lot of room, you know, between the uh, higher uh, revenue, higher priced uh, value propositions and the lower priced value propositions as well. Well, and one thing I think it'll do is it'll force folks to uh, think about who they want as their customers. I mean, certainly in, in recent years, you know, the airlines and cruise ships have been a rocket ship in terms of growth, but, you know, you look at the situation we're in today, and those folks that have exposure to the DOD and government and civil agencies are, you know, they're, they're happy people because those checks are still flowing. In fact, you know, the, the Pentagon is accelerating contract announcements. I get the contract announcements every night, you know, at five o'clock. It's like the end of the year, uh, fiscal year, when, when the contracts start flowing. Uh, and they're doing things to push more dollars down to vendors in terms of payment terms. So, uh, you know, you could see a little bit more of a pivot of, of folks looking at the government market more favorably. And certainly for the investors, which a lot of times treat the government as though it is coronavirus itself, uh, finding that, you know, those are good bedrock customers to have in the long term. Now, we are getting a, a lot of questions about the implications of the OneWeb bankruptcy on Starlink. In particular, people are wondering if the market for OneWeb was, was challenging, could the same be true for Starlink? Uh, if OneWeb struggled to raise money, could the same be true for Musk and SpaceX? Uh, and I suppose also to, to some extent also Telesat, uh, which is stockpiling cash and, and looking at how to finance their system, uh, a smaller constellation of around 300 satellites at, at last check. Um, I guess Chris, we'll, we'll continue with you. You keep leaving your, your mic on, so that's why I'm picking on you. But uh, <laughs> what do you think? I'm not it didn't work at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I got to catch up. That's what this is all about. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the implications are for these other mega constellations as far as uh, their ability to raise capital and then even their ability to have uh, a sound business plan if it's based on the consumer market in any considerable depth? Yeah, uh, so I think there's one major distinction between OneWeb and the other three big Leo broadband players, as we call them, you know, Amazon, Telesat, and SpaceX they all have alternative sources of cash generation, right, that, that serve as a backdrop, you know, for those companies to be able to continue to fund their efforts, even if there's a slowdown in the, in the investing environment. Uh, certainly, Amazon has no major concerns about funding their effort, uh, but for SpaceX and Telesat, they're going to be, uh, you know, to a much greater degree dependent on uh, third-party financing sources. Um, I think the environment has slowed. Uh, we're still seeing venture funding happening. We're still seeing private capital flowing. Uh, and certainly SpaceX, they've proven over time a, an ability to raise capital. 
as long as they can demonstrate to investors that that business model is sound and fundamental and it's different and, and positioned differently from what OneWeb was attempting to do, I think they'll still have access to the markets and can continue to, continue to move forward. Uh, Telesat has been on more of a holding pattern for the last year or two, in part due to uh, uncertainties around their supplier and vendor base, and certainly this situation doesn't help, uh, but I don't think it changes the uh, attractiveness, per se, of the business model that they had. And, and notably, they have a very different design than any of the other vendors out there. It's more of a traditional, uh, robust design with optical intersatellite links, full digital payload processing, uh, and is really targeted at a different market. So I think they each have their own different uh, story to tell. And, and although it's tempting to throw them all in the same bucket and say, oh, OneWeb went bankrupt and LeoSat went bankrupt, so these guys should all go bankrupt, I don't think that's the case. I just add another differentiator. You know, I, I said I'm skeptic. I'm a skeptic of the consumer broadband business, but clearly Starlink is also targeting the U.S. government, and their one of their first employees was their government sales guy. But their other main differentiator is that they're it's a vertical uh, manufacturing process. So they have control over the factory and the launch of the system internally, and they can turn the dial as needed, depending on how quickly or, or slowly the, the funding comes in, which they're pretty much the only example of that. Uh, Amazon would be able to do that probably themselves, you know, if they use Blue as a sister company or something, but, um, I don't think liquidity is an issue for them. Uh, it's still spectrum. Uh, for Telesat, you know, their DOD is going to be the Canadian government and, and potentially others, and uh, that's the backdrop to their business. But you know, as Chris said, they have revenue coming in that's keeping them where they need to be. Yeah, I think we can expect delays on Telesats because of the funding situation. They didn't make any you know, selections on their manufacturer, which was supposed to happen uh, a while already. And so I think, I think they're going to probably reassess their business plan for SpaceX, correct, about the inter vertical integration. I still like to see what the business case is of offering either consumer broadband or enterprise you know, uh, services and at what price point and where and how do they distribute that. Is it just all online? You just go online and you order everything. And like what was mentioned by Elon Musk, plug and play. Great. Would like to see some of those, you know, uh, actually in demonstration. Uh, right now, there's already over 360 satellites, I believe, up in orbit. Uh, where's the terminal for that? Yeah, this is, uh, we're always asking the terminal question. I'm looking forward to seeing one of these at a, a satellite conference, whenever the conference is coming back around. Um, you see, you'll often see on, on the show floor, uh, you know, big dishes, for people who want to show off equipment for military vendors and things like that. It will be really interesting to see when you have people out showing off consumer equipment for mega constellations. Right now, I'll just suggest, though, that Elon could certainly hold one up to a webcam, right? If it's a pizza-sized one. <laughs> yeah, if it's pizza box size, right, you can just hold it up. We can take a look at it. I think Greg Weiler also tweeted out one, $15. Yeah. And yeah. That was for a large uh, four topping pizza or was that for a, a phase array uh, antenna? And, yeah, so phase array antenna. After we talked about that, I went back and looked at it and it's a $15 antenna in theory or, you know, the path to become that still is going to lead to a $300 terminal. Yeah, fifteen dollar module of the terminal. So we're not near the you know this by any means. Mm -hmm. Not that this costs three hundred dollars either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually we did have a question from the audience about what the impact of uh, one web bankruptcy might have on the antenna companies. It seemed like there was a significant awareness amongst providers of uh, antennas that there's a strong need for uh, a product that they didn't have. And that was resulting in a lot of investment in that technology. I think there are a couple of startups out of Germany that were working on tech. Seacom was working with the University of Waterloo on a phased array antenna. And then you've got plenty in the US uh, and in other parts of Europe and, and likely elsewhere. Uh, 
what do you get? What do you think, uh, Janice? We'll, we'll pick up with you. Uh, do you think that those companies that their businesses will will suffer because they now don't have uh, as strong of a case to actually go and develop this really tricky technology? So we're always, you know, when people ask based on the data that we collect on on the investment, you know, what's lacking, and it's clearly ground. So the proportion of investment is is, you know, in addition to the Leo broadband, it's mostly launch, which again, doesn't, doesn't necessarily justify it when you look at the proportion of revenues coming out of that sector to the proportion of investment. When you look at the proportion of revenues that come from ground, the investment is nothing. I and mean, we're always saying, if you want to, you know, make them have the best bang for your buck, that's the area to go to. We need more investment in ground. I think that if anything, this should make that more clear. Well, we all know that space is a, a geek industry that, you know, rocket science, basically. So, yeah, that's why we have that skewed uh, angle towards, you know, more launch money. The ground is definitely the thing that will have, uh, I think, a big impact positively. But right now, they're certainly hurting. Let's remember that many of them are already supplying either mechanically steered or you know, partially electronically steered antennas to the aeronaut aeronautical uh, SACO market. And that market is hurting as was mentioned, and I'm not sure that's going to help them uh, anytime soon. They're going to have to pivot probably, and many of those uh, developments are still ongoing. Uh, there's a 25 or 30 companies that are trying to do something in this area, targeting government, military, land mobile, maritime, you know, uh, airborne, of course. Uh, airborne, by the way, is the toughest, uh, along with government. And uh, we'll see some probably consolidation in that market for sure. And I'm pretty sure also that we'll see some exits. Yeah, given the fact we now know that uh, OneWeb wasn't paying their bills, I seriously doubt that they were providing non-recurring engineering or NRE dollars to any of these companies. So kind of no loss there, you know, maybe an end market customer. But at the end of the day, as everybody here is saying the same thing, if somebody can make a low cost flat panel antenna, they're going to print money. It doesn't matter. I mean, Amazon or SpaceX will buy it if you can provide that product to the market. We've also had some questions. Uh, I said a note for our audience. We've got about eight minutes left. So thank you for sending your questions. I wish that we could get to all of them. We will not have time, but trying to go through as uh, many as we can. Um, another question on ground, this one about gateways. We had uh, some questions about what the other risks are for the ground segment side of it. One web had mentioned in the bankruptcy filing that they were about halfway through either building, uh, completing or building their 44 gateway ground stations. Um, I'm told that the, the ground side could also balloon with cost. Uh, we know that one was originally targeting a satellite manufacturing cost of 500,000 or less, less per satellite that ended up being about a million dollars per satellite, one would, uh, excuse me, not one would, uh, Airbus officially confirmed that, a partner. Uh, what is the risk on the ground side, uh, both for companies that might have supported OneWeb and building out gateway infrastructure, uh, and then how might that have been a, a hidden cost that the OneWeb system or, or OneWeb founders may not have uh, originally estimated to have gotten as high as it, it did? Well, we think it's all part of that, you know, CapEx uh, north of $5 billion. And uh, much of that, as we mentioned, the NRE on that one is excessive. And it takes about two to four years to get something going, a minimum, minimum, you know, recovering costs of your NRE for any sort of grounds. On the gateways, that's probably maybe less than half, I think, than or half of what was supposed to be the full constellation. So they were not there yet. We don't know if it's particularly, you know, if it's owned by them or if it's leased or what are the, the particulars of that. If it can be repurposed, sure, but you know, how many Ben Pipe Leo constellations out there are there? I don't think there's that many. Yeah, so we published a report yesterday where we went through all of the, uh, the assets of OneWeb from the satellites to the spectrum to the ground segment and tried to assign value of what might be recovered in this bankruptcy. When it comes to the ground network, I'm back at the same place. Unless you're going to build a Gen 1 uh, one web satellite system, that ground system is not of much use, nor are, is the spectrum of much use. And uh, if you want to talk about you know, potential uses for the satellites, uh, 
honestly, I mean, maybe there's some unique buyer that could use them for testing environment, but uh, more likely than not, uh, maybe you've got a company that wants to practice satellite servicing or debris removal, or there's a neat company in Japan called ALE that does light shows with satellites, and, you know, 74 of these would make a pretty good light show. <laughs> I don't know if these came with fireworks attached all the way down. The, uh, the political favors that may have been won by, you know, adding ground stations in certain areas are not going to transfer to the next owner either. Yeah, I know we, we had some questions about um, what happens if one were to deorbit the satellites, things like that. Um, I know I was just in touch with the ITU today because I'm working on an article about the one with bankruptcy. So this is a, a shameless plug for the Space News magazine. Um, and one of the things that they said to me was that if the satellites were deorbited, uh, so OneWeb has its own milestones for needing to um, reach bring into use, which they did within seven years of filing. And then they have, they reached the 10% marker. They've got until 2026 to, I believe hit 50%. But if they were to deorbit the, the satellites, then they would have three years to basically reclaim that spectrum. You, you have to have satellites, otherwise the spectrum loses its uh, its value, its priority status with the ITU. Uh, so that's a question uh, that uh, I could answer we'll, and we'll, I'll try to address more in the, the article that's coming up. One that we're getting a lot also, uh, we have people wondering who might buy OneWeb Spectrum. And so I'm gonna turn back to you guys for that. We've got a lot of people guessing Telesat. Uh, we've got some other people that are guessing. I'm mainly seeing, it's either constellation operators or specific um, FSS operators that are fairly well known. Uh, curious if anybody wants to throw out names as to who they think might be a good beneficiary of, of one. Hey, can I add a wrinkle to that question? Sure. Um, as you guys uh, assess who might want to buy any of these assets, keep in mind, is there anybody out there who might want to buy it defensively, might want to buy this as a blocking maneuver? as they may have filed for a spectrum that they don't tend to use as a blocking maneuver. Yeah, just if, if they don't want somebody else to have it. Well, there's only one constellation that doesn't have spectrum, and I don't think that they'll feel I need to buy it. And if anything, they use this as justification of why additional spectrum should be made available through the next round. So you don't think yeah. they're going to go and buy it? Well, I, th I think, you know, the important thing here and, and the half of the report we wrote was about the spectrum. And the spectrum is, they say right in the bankruptcy filings, it's their most important asset, but it's also extremely complicated uh, because there's different regulatory regimes between the FCC and the ITU. Uh, there's different bring into use dates. And uh, I think there's a lot of interpretation that also comes into place. Uh, so it, it's a tricky issue. I mean, I talked before about some of the folks that might be interested, but keep in mind that the core spectrum that people are interested in is the KU band user link uh, licenses, which came through Worldview and, you know, back in time. Um, right now, you've got a Telesat design and an Amazon design that are based on KA user links. And uh, I'm not a technical expert. I'm not an engineer, though I do have an engineering degree. Uh, but it, I know that you can't put diesel into a gasoline car or vice versa. So you have to basically think about re-architecting the entire system if you try to, if you're a Telesat or an Amazon and try to use, move over to a OneWeb license. I think if Amazon wants to do something defensive, as you asked, uh, Brian, this is it. This is the, you know, pocket money for them and just, you know, sit on it while uh, they're building their own constellation. And that way they prevent others from getting it. What others? Until such point that they fail to meet their bring into use, and at which point yeah. the uh, the filings get suppressed or voided. And we go out to another webinar, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're coming up at, on the hour. Did we address whether um, anybody's responsible for making sure those satellites are disposed of properly? If there's no one web is a going concern to handle that. That's the and if we did, maybe that's worth just reiterating quickly for because that's a that's a question a lot of people have. Right. So, you know, Ofcom would require that they deorbit the spacecraft if they cannot find a way to operate them themselves. Right. True. Yeah. Well, Caleb, do you want to bring us home? 
I think that was it. That was a really interesting discussion. So thank you to all of our panelists for participating, for joining us from your homes. Uh, shout out to everyone that has space or geographic posters. I see many of them uh, out there. Chris, I don't have any rockets to show off. I, I only have one rocket. So if anybody has rockets that they want to send me, I'm open. <laughs> there you go. And, and one, other, one other kind of programming note here, um, we did record this session. Our intent is to get this posted today for anybody who might have missed um, part of it or, um, or heard about it after the fact or couldn't get in. We had a cap registration at uh, 1,000 participants. But again, thanks to all of our guests today. I think we had a great conversation. I know I, for one, was kind of jonesing for a good panel discussion. And uh, I'm really glad that we were able to kind of make this happen and uh, look for uh, additional webinars from uh, Space News coming up in the not too distant future. Once this is on our website, uh, both on YouTube and um, on spacenews.com, let us know what you think in the comments section and we'll take that going forward. So thanks a lot, everybody. Stay safe, stay well. We'll all get through this and see each other again in person soon. Bye-bye.